Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Audio Series. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today and to our guest speaker, Dr. David Rabiner of Duke University. Um, Dr. Rabiner will be discussing a topic of huge interest to any parent of a child with ADHD, and that is how to monitor your child's treatment effectively. As all of you know from experience, it can be quite difficult to figure out what the best treatment plan for your child, how to monitor your child's symptoms, and adjust treatment is Dr. Rabiner's topic today. So he'll also discuss determining how your child's symptoms are affecting his school life, medication management tips, and monthly assessment strategies for finding the right dosage. Dr. Rabiner is a research professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke University. His research focus, scientific focus, has been on the long and short-term impact of attention problems on children's academic achievements, as well as the non-medical use of ADHD medications by college students. He has published over 50 scientific papers in scholarly journals and received multiple federal grants to support his work. In recent years, since 1997, he has published a wonderful online newsletter, which I can't recommend to you enough. It's called Attention Research Update, and it helps parents, educators, and health professionals keep up with new research on ADHD. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rubiner. We're so pleased to have you. Well, thank you, Susan, and uh, glad to be here and glad to see there are so many folks um, watching and listening in today. I'm I'm going to talk about, uh, as Susan said, um, monitoring your child's ADHD treatment. Um, I can't stress enough how important this can be and and that I really feel that uh, learning how to do this and making sure it happens is really one of the most important things that any parent can do to to really try to help maximize the the long-term success of their child. Um, So uh, it's a topic that's, that's really near and dear uh, to my heart. Um, so let's just start by talking briefly about what ADHD treatment monitoring is. It's, it's, it's really pretty simple and straightforward. All we're talking about is, is collecting uh, data on the child's behavior, on the child's academic functioning, on the child's social functioning, collecting that in a systematic way at regular intervals, either weekly or monthly is, is typical, um, so that you get information on a regular basis that lets you know really how things are going, and in particular, how things are going at school. Obviously, parents observe their child at home. You have a clear sense of how he or she is doing there, but what goes on at school can be somewhat of a black box, and that's why uh, collecting regular feedback from from teachers uh, is really so critical. Um, I want to emphasize that this is an, an absolutely critically important thing to do, irrespective of what treatment your child is receiving, whether your child's treatment is medication only, whether it's medication plus behavior therapy, whether medication is not involved in all, at all and you're trying something like neurofeedback or some kind of dietary intervention. It really doesn't matter what the treatment is, whatever treatment the child is receiving, Uh, it's important to monitor how he or she is doing. Just as important, actually, if your child is not receiving any treatment at all. Um, This is no great uh, surprise that I'm saying this. Uh, The importance of regular systematic treatment monitoring has been advocated for years by the American Academy of Pediatrics, by the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, What's a shame, unfortunately, is how infrequently this happens, uh, very rarely. So uh, why is treatment monitoring important? Um, This is really an important point that um, uh, even though uh, a child may be doing quite well at a particular point in time, um, uh, a child starts out on 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 whatever the treatment happens to be, and it really seems like, wow, this is great. Things are going well. I'm so pleased. Parents really have to uh, recognize that, unfortunately, a children's response to treatment, whatever that treatment happens to be, can and does change over time. Um, so things may be going really well uh, in January and come February, not, not so well anymore. Um, so that's, that's one reason, just the, the change in children's response over time. The other reason why it's really important is generally um, – uh, there are, or there should be, uh, as part of any treatment plan, particular goals that, uh, that uh, the parent and the child's health care provider are hoping will be met 
uh, with treatment. Those can be uh, goals related to academic functioning, goals related to behavioral functioning, goals related to social functioning. And if sort of all you get back is an occasional uh, things seem to be going okay from the teacher, that is absolutely not specific enough to have a clear idea about where things are going well, where things are going less well, which of the, say, three or four important goals uh, that you've got for your child's treatment, which of those look like they're being met, and, and where is there really important uh, need for improvement, and, and where, are the, where is it that the specific problems remain uh, that need to be addressed? Um, as I said earlier, uh, this is really a critically important way um, uh, for parents to help promote their child's long-term success. Okay, what should be monitored? Okay, so I think that there are really uh, a couple of main um, uh, things that are important uh, to be monitored regularly. One is just the core ADHD symptoms of inattention and hyperactive impulsive behavior. So one aspect of monitoring is to try to know specifically how well those primary uh, core ADHD symptoms seem to be being managed by whatever treatment a child is receiving. Okay, and then because, of course, one thing we care about is managing core ADHD symptoms. Ultimately, what we care about is how well the child is actually functioning in important domains. Um, again, at home, parents will have a sense of that from what they can observe, but not so much in school. So what we'd want to hear regularly uh, from the child's teacher is not just how well are uh, problems related specifically to inattention and hyperactive impulsive behavior being managed. But in addition to that, how is the child's academic performance? What is their behavioral performance in terms of their overall ability to meet behavioral expectations and conform to classroom rules? And then how are things going in their, in their peer relationship? So academic functioning, behavioral functioning, and social functioning are certainly three the three primary domains that we'd want to uh, be monitoring. And then for children where medication is part of their treatment, uh, some kind of an ongoing assessment of uh, that will indicate whether there may be any kind of adverse effects that are emerging uh, is important to do as well. So what difference uh, does this uh, uh, treatment monitoring make? And, and I just want to say when we get to the end of the, the, end of the session, I'll, I'll be talking in a very concrete way about how parents can, can do this and how parents can facilitate this. So to get an idea of what difference this uh, can make, I'm going to talk very briefly about something called the Multimodal Treatment Study of ADHD. It's uh, called the MTA study for short. This was the largest ADHD treatment study ever conducted. Uh, to my knowledge, it's the largest treatment study ever conducted in child psychiatry, period. Um, it began with uh, nearly 580 uh, uh, children with ADHD between the ages, I believe it was 7 to 11, it might have been 7 to 12. Um, those children uh, were essentially assigned at random, uh, in other words, almost like kind of flipping a, a coin, um, uh, to receive either medication management through the study itself, uh, a very intensive form of behavior therapy that was delivered uh, by uh, the researchers in the study, a combination of medication treatment and behavior therapy. And then about 25% of the sample was randomly assigned not to receive any type of treatment through the study, but just to go back out into their community and receive whatever treatment in the community that parents elected to pursue for their child. Now, it turns out, not surprisingly, that of those children uh, who were uh, received care strictly in their own community, the, the vast majority uh, received medication uh, treatment. So uh, it's important to say a little bit about how medication treatment was done in the MTA study. It began with this incredibly uh, careful, meticulous titration trial to identify what was the best starting uh, medication and starting dose for each child. And so essentially what they did is each day the child was switched between kind of a low dose, a medium dose, a high dose, or a placebo. So a placebo, as you know, is where as far as anybody knows, the child is actually receiving uh, real medication, but, but that's actually not, not the case. Um, and this went on for a full month, and there was regular feedback 
uh, collected from parents and, and, and particularly importantly from teachers. So at the end of that one month trial, um, the researchers could look at how the child did on each of the different doses relative to placebo and uh, determine A, is there evidence that medication really made a difference? And if so, which dose seems like it was optimal? Where, where should we start the child out at? And needless to say, uh, that procedure I just described briefly is so much more elaborate than anything that would ever be done in, in the community. Uh, that type of thing would absolutely never happen. Uh, after uh, the child began on medication using the optimally identified dose uh, that came from that careful trial, then uh, there were, for kids who were in the, get, getting their treatment through the study, there were monthly follow-ups, monthly follow-up visits with parents uh, and monthly uh, collecting uh, direct feedback from teachers about how that child was doing in their classroom. And the purpose of those follow-ups was really to, to learn whether or not, even though uh, the child's symptoms may have been managed quite well uh, at, uh, at the start of, of, of the treatment, uh, was there indication that um, things were sort of deteriorating a bit um, so that the, uh, the treating uh, physician uh, could decide, do we need to make adjustments to this child's treatment? Do we need, uh, in this case, to, uh, to their medication treatment? So they began with this very careful trial. They then got regular monthly feedback from parents and teachers and used that information essentially to decide, are things continuing to go well so we don't need to do anything, or is there evidence that we need to make some type of adjustment? And the main point I want to uh, make is that despite that incredibly careful trial to start with the optimal dose for each child in the study, that changes and adjustments to the child's medication treatment were extremely common. So within the first three months, over half of the children who were, who were treated through the study uh, required an adjustment uh, to their treatment. And over the full 12 months um, on, over which treatment occurred, that multiple adjustments in, 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 in medication and or dose were, were, were common. There were actually very, very few of the children who stayed on the same dose or the same medication uh, throughout the course of the, the 12 months. Um, more often than not, when adjustments had to be made, uh, the adjustments were in the direction of increasing the dose, but about one third of the time, the best judgment of the treating clinician was that actually the child's dose needed to be adjusted downwards. But again, the main point is that despite uh, beginning with this incredibly careful trial, that adjustments to treatment were frequent and common. And so if you compare that with what happens typically in uh, for children who are treated just by uh, physicians in the community. Well, unfortunately, what we know is this kind of systematic monitoring almost never occurs, literally almost never occurs. Uh, and so as a result of that, of course, uh, you're going to have kids who are maintained over long stretches of time on a treatment that is not being as helpful as it could be. Um, so certainly there are kids who are maintained for extended periods on, on a particular medication or dose that is just not doing what it could be doing, uh, and children who are maintained on other forms of treatment where it's just not uh, being particularly effective. Um, it's easy for parents to sometimes think, well, no news is good news. If they're not hearing frequent uh, concerns from the teacher that things might must be going okay, well, Unfortunately, people often find out that's, that's, absolutely, uh, that's absolutely not the case. So uh, did we get evidence uh, in the MTA study that that careful treatment monitoring, did it really matter? Well, it looks like it did matter. Uh, during that first year, um, which is, uh, again, there was a roughly 12 to 13 month period that treatment through the study was provided that those children who received this kind of careful monitoring, it did look like they were, in some important ways, doing better. So if we look at it just in terms of the proportion of children treated uh, in the study compared to children treated in the community that had their core ADHD symptoms normalized, and normalized is defined as
as they were no longer sort of in a clinically elevated range, but were at a level that was not atypical for, uh, for children of the same age who don't have ADHD. Uh, you can see that uh, for kids treated with medication through the study, about 56% had their symptoms uh, normalized compared to only about 25% of children who receive their treatment in the community. In the community. So that's more than double, um, which is a, a pretty substantial difference. So um, I'm going to talk now about uh, a relatively simple way that parents can, as this school year gets underway, uh, implement this kind of monitoring program uh, for their child. And let me just say that um, this is the kind of this kind of systematic monitoring that I'm talking about. It's something that parents have to demand. Um, you, the typical, uh, unfortunately, the data that's been come out lately about how often is this type of thing initiated by by physicians? It looks like almost never. Um, almost never. I mean, we're talking about less than in less than uh, probably less than 10 percent. Of, of, of the cases, and even in those 10%, it's still not kind of on any kind of regular, uh, say, monthly basis. So I apologize that the, the wording here is, uh, on this slide is, is, is a bit teeny. Um, this is actually uh, something that I developed uh, probably about 15 years ago. Can't see the title. It's called the ADHD Monitoring System. And it, all it is is a simple, uh, as you can see, a simple behavior rating form that would take uh, your child's teacher about five minutes to complete uh, w once a month, which is not too bad. Um, and if you look, uh, if you can see the items um, uh, on the left-hand side there, the first six items are uh, behaviors that are indicative of, of hyperactive impulsive behavior. So fidgeting with hands or feet or squirming in the seat, difficulty remaining seated, difficulty waiting to turn, et cetera. A teacher just indicates uh, by circling one of those numbers whether that's something that she observed not at all uh, in, in your child that month or, or very much, uh, observed it very, very, very frequently. Uh, the next six items, uh, starting with number seven, easily distracted, uh, failing to complete assigned tasks, trouble paying attention. Those are looking at the core symptoms of, of inattentive behavior and, again, rated on the same scale. And then uh, for items 13 through 15, those are just very, very crude screens about behavioral functioning, uh, social functioning, and, and emotional functioning. So following class rules. In this case, higher numbers are better. So zero means not at all. Three means very much. Getting along with peers from not at all to very much. Seeming happy and in a good mood from not at all to very much. Okay. Um, on the right-hand column, um, there's an item that asks the teacher to rate how the child's functioning in the morning compared uh, to the afternoon. Uh, the teachers rate approximately what percentage of assigned work uh, the child uh, completed um, uh, either during the past week or there's another version that asks for that on a monthly basis. And then um, the quality of the child's work in general from very poor to excellent. And then three simple little boxes where they can uh, provide a little bit more detailed information. So this is something that takes literally about five minutes to complete that gives you uh, enough information uh, to decide, A, does it look like the core ADHD symptoms are being managed reasonably well? Uh, what does it look like the teacher observes in terms of my child's ability to follow class rules, get along with peers, what's their mood like, and then gives me some information and the physician information uh, on uh, the quality of the academic work, both how much of the work is being completed and the quality of the work that is completed. So what you get from that, this, uh, this kind of just shows the results of what one of those rating forms uh, would provide for you. So I'm going to go back uh, for the f first, uh, first case. Um, and if you look at that, uh, what you can see, and this is a situation where with a quick glance, you could look at that and say, wow, this, is, this was a good week or this was a good month. Um, everything seems to be going well. So what we want to see is that for the first 
12 items that deal with the core symptoms of ADHD, we want to see mostly zeros and ones because that means that uh, that, that behavior is either not being observed at all or is being observed only a little bit. And you can see here for those first 12 items, there's no symptom that's rated as, as being uh, observed more than uh, just a little bit. And then for the next three items, uh, 13, 14, and 15, that's where we want to see twos and threes. So following class rules pretty often, getting along with peers pretty often, seeming happy in a good mood pretty often. Then at the bottom, we look at uh, information related to academic functioning. Um, the child completed essentially all their work. The quality of the work was good. And then a little bit more detail uh, about how work in different areas uh, compares. So it takes the teacher five minutes to complete this. It takes a parent uh, and or the child's health care provider five minutes to scan this and, and get a sense that this is a case where everything looks great. The next one is, is different. Um, what you see up top in the first 12 items is that, wow, these, uh, you know, these core ADHD symptoms are not being managed well. And what I, the point I want to emphasize is that prior slide that showed everything going well, that could have, you could have gotten that at the, in, the, in the first month of the year or in October, and then in November, you get this instead. I mean, those kinds of changes do happen. And so what you're alerted to here is, A, even if, uh, let's say this is a child on meds, even if meds had been working pretty well up to this month, they sure don't seem to be working very well now. And then when you look underneath it, it's not only has the core uh, symptoms of ADHD showed a real uh, deterioration, um, but what you also see is that, wow, this is a child who, according to the teacher, not doing a good job of meeting behavioral expectations, not getting along with peers, not seeming particularly happy, uh, not turning in a lot of the work. The quality of the work is poor. So all you have to do, you, you just look at that for a minute and you know you need to do something. Now, what you need to do is not answered by this. But if this is something that comes home to a parent, what you do know is, wow, I have got to, uh, you know, get in and, and discuss this with uh, my child's health care provider um, because he or she needs to know as, as, as soon as possible that things are not going well and that some kind of adjustment is probably indicated. Again, don't know what that is, but the main point is, is that rather than potentially you know, two, three, four months going by when this is the kind of thing that's going on, you're alerted relatively early in the process if things start to go south when you can then, you know, make hopefully modifications that will, that will make a difference, that will get things back to um, uh, where they hopefully had been. And then uh, this last case is, is interesting in that, um, and this happens sometimes, so when you look up at the first 12 items, you see that for the most part, the ADHD, the core ADHD symptoms seem to be uh, managed pretty well. Uh, there are no threes, which are the, the, the you know the most uh, the highest level. A couple of twos for inattention, but overall, it looks like the core ADHD symptoms are in reasonably good shape. But then, when you look down below, what you can see is that. Wow, even though the core symptoms seem to be doing okay, um, there are real problems with uh, following class rules, social functioning, emotional functioning, and, and getting the work done. And, and, and kind of what this tells you is that, you know, um, since the core ADHD symptoms are, do seem to be uh, under reasonable control, it's probably not the case that just if the child's on medication, you know, making an adjustment there to, to, you know, to try to address ADHD symptoms is likely going to be all that productive in these other areas. Um, and, and so when you see that the core symptoms look good and these other things don't look so good, you really would want to talk with your provider or the provider would want to think about, you know, what other kinds of interventions do we need to put into place to address these sort of other important problems in these key functional domains, even though the child's core ADHD symptoms seem to be going okay. 
Um, so again, it takes the teacher five minutes a month and takes relatively little time on the part of a parent or provider who has this data uh, to know how well things are going and, and when do we need to make some adjustments. So uh, what I would want to encourage each of you to do is that as the new school year begins, to ask yourself, gee, is there already a plan in place to, manage, uh, to monitor how your child is doing, uh, particularly at school where you can't observe uh, things, obviously, on a daily basis? If there is no such plan in place, you really need to initiate a discussion about putting a plan in place with your provider because chances are it's not going to be something that the provider uh, initiates on, on his or her own. And these are just two different ways you can do that. Um, at that uh, first link there um, is where you can download uh, completely for, uh, for free this uh, monitoring tool that, um, that I just reviewed. And it has not just the rating forms, but a pretty detailed set of instructions that tells you how to use it and how to interpret the, the data that comes back. And then uh, through a collaboration uh, that I have with a company called Attention Point, that's actually now collaborating with, with Chad, um, they've developed an online system uh, that parents can access and uh, provide information about how to use that online system to their child's provider. And their child's healthcare provider can then use this web-based system to get information uh, uh, using a variety of different uh, actually rating forms to help them track how well your child is doing at school and if they'd like at home uh, on a monthly uh, basis. That's also uh, available for, I think it's for a full year for absolutely no charge and that the, the web-based nature of it can really facilitate getting the information back and forth between uh, providers and, and teachers. So. Um, I'll stop there and take questions, but, but again, just really want to emphasize uh, to the importance of trying to put something like this in place, and these are, these are just two simple options that, that would allow you to do that. Thank you. That, that's a great pay tool. I love one, a place on one page where you, you know, it's really elegantly done to capture the whole picture. Um, what's your experience with... Um, teachers and schools being willing to, to complete a form like this on a monthly basis? Well, um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's a good question. Um, and what I can say is, in my experience, you know, I haven't practiced for a while, uh, but when I was able to explain to uh, teachers the importance of this and to show them, you know, what the child's parent um, and uh, provider we learn and how important uh, that information was and the fact that it would take them about three to five minutes once a month. You know, the, uh, the compliance was, was pretty good. Um, the, I will say that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the use of kind of a web-based system um, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the system allows sort of automatic reminders to be sent uh, uh, directly from the provider to teachers. It does, it, it does increase the yield of, of getting these things back. But, you know, just like, uh, just like parents have to take the initiative um, with, uh, with healthcare professionals to make this happen, um, uh, you know, they got to take, the, uh, take it with, with the teachers. And I know how tough that can be and, and how much, uh, how difficult uh, it, it can be. Uh, but the, the importance really can't be overemphasized. Right. No, it seems like a hugely uh, helpful tool. Um, Michelle, who's on the webinar, said that her school has been very terrific in terms of providing survey feedback, whereas uh -huh. other people have, who are on, online have said that, you know, they'd be more likely to give school teachers a form, teachers forms uh -huh. to fill out about teachers' performance. But, yeah, um, well, lots of uh, gratitude here, Dr. Rabinner. This is a great form. People are saying they're going to download it. It's going to be really helpful to them. So thank you for, um, for that great form. Um, Kathy asks, what are Dr. Rabinner's thoughts about using the Vanderbilt assessment tool for monitoring? That, I think that's fine. I mean, you know, to be perfectly candid, you know, these rating forms, you know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, some of them are copyrighted and, and, and they, they, they're, right. they're, not, they're not inexpensive, 
they're all basically, I don't want to say they're basically the same, but you right, know, right. they're, they're all, co- you know, the, the symptoms of ADHD are the symptoms of ADHD. So they're all covering that and they're all going to have, uh, you know, they all, all should have, uh, several items that ca- uh, that cover basic behavioral functioning, basic social functioning and basic academic functioning. And whether you're using the system that I developed or something like the Vanderbilt, doesn't matter. I, I can honestly okay. say it does. What matters is that there is something systematic in place that's happening on a regular basis. If you do that, regardless of what the form is, as long as it's some kind of semi-reasonable form that covers ADHD symptoms and, and, and functioning in the important domains, you are, way, you are just way ahead of the game. I mean, I think what's what's nice about your your form is it, again, it is it is five minutes. Um, right. It, you know, it, you can certainly make a case. I think if you can explain, and I think your advice about getting the teacher on board um, and on your side and understanding what the purpose of this is, is, it sounds like really good advice in terms of oh. getting them to accept this. Um, yep. A couple of questions from folks. One is, um, how would you implement this for? For a, a, it's as daunting to think about trying to get feedback from seven different teachers. Well, so that, that okay. great question. Um, I would say this uh, that um, um, it is incredibly difficult. Certainly, if you're, I mean, once kids get uh, to middle school, where there's no longer one teacher that's primarily responsible for them, uh-huh. you know, no doubt it gets much more difficult. Particularly if you're trying to use paper and pencil, right? It, it, that that's right. just almost impossible. That is where the real benefit of this web-based system mm-hmm. comes in, because with the web-based system, you know, the, 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 cl- the clinician, uh, and, and just to be clear, the way this thing is set up, that parents would log on to that site, uh, they download information that they would then bring about this system to their child's provider, and then the child's provider would have to register and say, yeah, I want to do this. Um, but once they do, you know, the, the provider just has to essentially type in the, uh, you know, the, the email addresses for the teachers one time, set up the intervals on which they want that feedback uh, to, to be provided to them, um, and, and then it happens sort of automatically. And, and again, there can be, uh, you know, reminders that are programmed to, uh, to automatically go to each of those teachers. So I'm still not saying you're going to, you know, if you've got seven teachers, you're going to hit seven for seven every month, right? But it will, right. it will so greatly facilitate being at least getting feedback from multiple teachers on a regular basis that, again, if you're, if you're relying on pencil and paper in middle school yeah. or high school, it's just really, really hard. I mean, we have a hard enough time getting kids' homework to and from. So yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Is the attention point system expensive? Is it free? How does it? Um, it sounds like a, a great solution. Yeah. So, um, uh, so if parents, uh, if a if a parent brings this to their child's uh, physician, clinician, it doesn't have to be a medical doctor. It could be a psychologist. Um, uh, this uh, sort of um, uh, opportunity that uh, they're making available, it's really through a partnership with, with Chad, um, is, that, mm-hmm. that, is that the clinician uh, can use that to provide uh, treatment monitoring for that child uh, for a full year, and there'll be, no, there'll be no charge at all to the clinician. Now, if the clinician chooses to charge the parent for whatever time they put into it, you know, that's, that's up to the, between the clinician and the parent. But, right. but attention point itself is, is sort of making this monitoring service available for, for a year at, at no charge. That's great. That's really great. Position. Um, is that, a, I, I think I know the answer to this. Is that online system available outside the U S um, maybe no. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure about that. You know, to my knowledge, it certainly hasn't been translated into, uh, into any other languages, but you know, if you're talking about like an English speaking country, it, as far as I know, it, it may very well be. I don't, I don't, I don't know okay. for sure. I don't. Yeah. Just, to, just before we, just to finish with rating scales, someone else asks about the Connors rating scale. Although she says, Trish, that she really likes the way the questions are phrased in yours, because sometimes you have to push the point home to the teachers that it does that nice. Yours does that nicely. So, is a Connors used also for uh, monitoring? 
Well, the, the, the main point I want to make is nothing is used for monitoring because monitoring right. essentially never happens. Um, the Connors, you know, and, and, and any of these scales can be used for monitoring. The Connors certainly could be. Um, uh, you know, the problem, uh, you know, for, for monitoring purposes, the problem with something like the Connors is if, at least if you use the long version, there are a lot of items on there. Right, you know, right. and, and and so it's gonna it's gonna take teachers a, a longer period of time. They also have a short form, and and that can certainly be used. Um, and and so I would just encourage parents, you know, don't get bogged down in the form. You know, get get right. put your energy into 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 choosing something and working with your child's provider to put a regular uh, system into place because that's much mm -hmm. more important. You know, unless you just pull some cockamamie form that's really got nothing to do with ADHD in, in a way, you know, any of the ones that you've heard about, the, the Connors, the Vanderbilt, the, the BASC, the Child Behavior Checklist, the ADHD Rating Scale, you know, they go on and on. Um, any of those will do a, will do a great job. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the key is getting it. Just do something, yeah. Getting yeah. it in place, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and monthly is optimal, correct? Yes. Susan asked whether weekly... Well, better. you know, so uh, you know, weekly. Um, there, there's certainly you know, weekly. Weekly is, you know, we, weekly is good. Um, it does put a little bit more of a burden on on teachers. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the 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 other issue with with weekly is if you're going to do it weekly, and and that that sort of downloadable form that I have online, it, it has both a, a, a weekly version and a monthly version. You know, if if it's weekly, right? If 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 you saw uh, from one week to the next, it looked like things had had deteriorated. Well, I, I wouldn't go ahead based on one week and say, oh, you know, well, we have to make adjustments. You'd want to you'd want to see some kind of a, 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 a consistent evidence of, of a decline over over a period of weeks. Um, you know, the monthly thing sort of gets around that in a way because if it's bad, it's been bad. It's been bad for a month. Um, but um, y you know, there's. Uh, weekly there's ways in which you know more frequent information uh you know can be better it's just it's just harder to get it's hard, particularly if you do a right, pencil right. and paper um and and again what was done in the mta study which is sort of the model uh was this kind of monthly uh follow-up monthly seems like a reasonable amount of time in terms of getting the input from the teacher and still having a timely timely situation addressed right. um a um, couple of people on the webinar have children in college yep. <laughs> and are wondering what you would advise in terms of monitoring um, the situation. Boy, parents of college students have a tough time, as, as you know. Yeah. School's not allowed to say anything to the parents no. at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I work at Duke, right? I mean, I, I, yeah. if a parent calls me, I, I can't even tell them no. what classes the child is in, let alone no. how they're doing. Um, and so I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately. I mean, children, uh, students have to, uh, you know, students have to monitor themselves and, and how they're doing. I mean, there's no way. I mean, I, I guess a, a student could give consent uh, to their uh, to their faculty to, you know, to let parents know is my kid showing up to class? Are they doing? But right. that's not going to happen. Um, no. Uh, so, well, as a, as a parent of a college student with ADHD, I can only give you my personal advice, and that was visit frequently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> visit frequently, no matter how far away it is. I mean, that's yeah. really the only way I was able to get any clear picture of, of mm -hmm. how things were going. But and you know, more and more, you know, more and more schools, uh, you know, like so. For example, at Duke now, we have an ADHD coach in the uh, in the academic wow. resource center, and. Um, I think there are certainly, uh, you know, there are certainly more and more schools that uh, are offering services, mm -hmm. certainly plenty of academic support services and, and, and coaching. UNC has a big coaching program. And, and so that would really be the, the, it really has to be somebody else other than the parent, I think, who right. could be monitoring, uh, you know, kind of a college yeah. student. Yeah. And then as parents have called, a couple of people have posted, the problem is, you know, if your child wants to right. be involved or not, which is a whole other issue at this age, yep. Yep. many kids just stop taking medication for whatever reason. Yeah, um, good problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. 
question about attention point. Can it be used without clinician support? No, it cannot. No. It, it's so not something. Yeah. No, it's not something that parents can access on. Parents can bring it to the attention of their child's health care provider and say, I really want you to do this with my child this year. But then the provider has to step up and say, OK, let's do okay. this. It, it can't be done directly by parents. And in terms of meeting, mo taking the monitoring and meeting with a health care professional, is, Cindy wants to know, is every three months sufficient in your view? Well, if things are going well. You know, if, yeah. if, if you're getting these monthly ready forms back and it looks like everything, you know, core symptoms are being managed well, things are going well in terms of behavior, social, emotional functioning, academic work looks looks good. If things are going well, then uh, then yes. Um, if if they're not, then no. I, I mean, you know, right. if, uh, so the, you know, the first the first time uh, one of those monthly forms came back and it looked like there was a clear deterioration. I would I would want to I would want to get in as soon as I can and right. say, you know, don't know what's going on, but it's not like it had been. What what let's figure out what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there are questions. People are asking whether this form can and I can can signal that there are other problems, bullying, friendship. And I mean, I think those last questions certainly could trigger some concern, right? I mean, even if yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, they don't they don't tell you why the no rating form is going to tell you right. what explains the problem. It can just alert you to the fact that gee, things don't seem to be going very well in the social domain. I need to learn. My provider needs to learn more about that. So it's really just serving an alerting function. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it's hard work to sort of dig in and, and try to figure out as best one can, you know, how do we understand uh, the difficulties that my child is having in, in this domain or that domain? And then what, what do we try to what do we try to do about it? The, you know, the, right. unfortunately, again, in the absence of any kind of regular monitoring, six months can go by and, and that kind of problem is happening. And just right. people you think you'd know, but oftentimes you just don't. Right. Um, Sherry wants to know, for a pediatrician who doesn't have much time to monitor, could if he sets it up, could she monitor it? I guess she means make sure the teachers are filling out the forms. Um, uh, no, 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 no. So only, the only person who sees the data is the, is the healthcare professional. Is that uh, right? To, uh, that's that, that that's my understanding that it that it yeah. that it goes between it goes between the parent and the provider and between the the clinician uh, between the teacher and the provider. Um, I would. Uh, I'll need to see whether or not the parents can be brought into the loop. I. I, I don't. I don't think so. Um, so okay. you know that 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 would be that would be the you know, if, if you don't if you don't feel like you can count on your provider to do this um, uh, even after really discussing it with him or her, then that's where you know there. Uh, to my knowledge, there's, there's not an alternative to the paper and pencil version, right? Because that's something that that the, that the parents pick up or can be sent back home to the parents, uh, you know, with, with the uh, with the child. Okay. Yeah. Not, if you, and let me just stress that my my form is not copyrighted. I would like people, if they think it would be useful to them, use it in whatever way they want. Period. That is so terrific. Wow. Anne says, I love this form. I've been using it for a number of years. I've oh. even included it in my daughter's IEP. So there you go. She says, um, some teachers don't take it very seriously, but when the teacher's on board, the information's invaluable, and thank you. So, great. Um, and yeah, it's, it's definitely great. Um, a couple of questions about um, when a child's symptoms change, the, the, the control of the symptoms changes during the day. So there are a couple mm -hmm. of people who, um, whose children do all right in the morning, but then when they get home from school, they don't do all right. Any suggestions for how to monitor that in the classroom? Yeah, so that's why there's so one question. Well, there's, one, yeah. there's, there's one question on the forum that asks, how does, how does the child's functioning in the, in the afternoon compare to the morning? Okay. Um, and so, you know, if there's a real discrepancy there, that would be noted. Um, you know, I actually created this form uh, sort of back in the days, pretty much before all the long-acting meds were in place. Mm -hmm. And so it was pretty common for, you know, students to just be dosed once a day with a short-acting stimulant. Right. And, and by midday, it was gone. And, and so you would there, you would clearly see 
uh, in those cases that, you know, afternoon was just not so good. Um, right. uh, hopefully that would be a little bit less prevalent now because the, the preparations are supposed to last eight, eight, 10 hours. But yeah, but again, but that's not, obviously that's not always the case. And the main thing right. is, you know, if a, if a child's on a med that's supposed to be a once a day med and you're seeing uh, information coming back that, well, morning is pretty good, but afternoon is, is not, then again, you're alerted to that. And then it's the hard work of figuring out with a, with a provider, okay, how, how do we try to, what can we do to try right. to address that? Is that like kind of a booster yes. dose with the shoe? But, right. you know, again, that's, that, that's where the professional has to, you know, Absolutely. use their best judgment. Yep. And to the person who asked this question, yes, it is the case that booster doses are used. Um, again, your healthcare provider is the best person to work out with you how to deal, to, to, to manage a situation where the symptoms are not controlled during the whole day, but it's definitely the case that people do, that there is use of a, a booster dose. Um, Beverly looked on, on the attention point site and reports that Definipoint is designed for use by individuals holding a state license in a category to permit the individual to administer, score, and interpret psychological tests. This includes, but is not limited to, psychologists, school and clinical and school, neuropsychologists, physicians, pediatricians, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. So um, she's pleased because that means the school psychologist could help you set up the system. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So that mm -hmm. would be a, a great solution. And maybe that's the place to start in terms of getting the school on board. Um, all right. Um, let's see. Who? How to monitor in two different homes. My daughter's father and I are divorced. Our observations of her behavior are quite in our homes are quite different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that's not an uncommon problem. No, and uh, okay. well, just just that um, you know, I mean, I guess the main thing that I would uh, sort of emphasize there is is that you know it's not uncommon for children in general, let alone children who are diagnosed with ADHD, to, to you know to behave very differently in different contexts. So it's not necessarily the mm -hmm. case that one parent is seeing things accurately and the other is seeing it inaccurately. Um, kids behave, you know, you see that same thing in middle school where, you know, in, in, in one classroom that the child is, is fabulous and then, then the other two or three, they may be really struggling. Um, so, so that happens and, and, you know, there are no easy answers. Uh, all you can do is, again, work with, uh, hopefully both parents are committed to working with a professional uh, to uh, address the difficulties that a child is having in, in whichever home they're, they're having them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, thanks for the Google Doc idea from Sherry to Kimberly. Thank you so much. Great idea. Um, here's an interesting question. It's not really about monitoring, but I'd be, I'd be curious to know your, your, your thoughts on this. Jennifer wants to know, what do you attribute the frequent need for medication adjustment to? Is the body getting used to the medication, or um, is then higher doses needed, or or is it the the body, it's the child's body is changing? Yeah. So I don't know. That's really yeah. I don't. That's yeah. sort of beyond my area of expertise. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I I don't know. You know. So it, it could certainly be differences in uh, you know in, in in how you know the physiological response of the medication over time. It also can be you know there are changes. Uh, it may not be necessarily so much that um, uh, the, the actual response to the medication is different, but it can be that, that there are new stressors that emerge in a child's mm -hmm. life so that, right. you know, what, what, what was adequate to manage things before is with these increased stressors is, is no longer sufficient in and of itself. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, there, there can be all different kinds of, of things that are likely to uh, come into play for sense. different children. Right. Right. Um, in terms of coming back to the teachers um, participating, um, I just want to point out that Kathy says that she's a school social worker with them and mother to four ADHD children, and she feels pretty comfortable that the vast majority of teachers would be happy to complete this. And mm -hmm. most of the time, they, they feel disappointed that the physician isn't asking for their input. That's an interesting idea, you know, that uh -huh. they, they would like to have input. Others well, are know. asking. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was going to say, you know, not to pick on, uh, you know, physicians because, um, you know, I think what 
has to be realized is that some, for example, uh, community-based pediatricians, they could have a, they could have a, a, a client load of, of ho literally hundreds of children in their practice with ADHD, certainly dozens. Um, but, you know, in this study that was published, uh, I don't know, about a year or so ago that looked at things like treatment monitoring among a group of about 200 community-based pediatricians, um, what was reported that it was only, I think it was only about in seven or eight percent of the of the cases was there any kind of follow-up information um, collected from directly from teachers wow. and that we're, we're talking about what then that may have been just like once in the course of an entire year uh, if wow. you looked at how, in how many of those cases was there any kind of monthly feedback that was collected from teachers we're probably talking you know my guess would be you know under one percent uh that right. may be overly pessimistic but yeah no we do have some experts at attitude physicians and and who talk frequently about the lack of information on the part of most pediatricians and who are the people who prescribe most ADHD medications, not well trained in ADHD and um, very stressed in terms of time. So yeah, yeah, it's a hard you know, job. It's, it's a very tough one. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of interest here and many people are setting up their children's IEP right now. In fact, one person is having that meeting tomorrow. Uh huh. Is this for a form that, you know, might be added to the IEP? I don't see why not. I don't yeah. see why not. I mean, you know, um, it's possible. Uh, it's possible that parents, uh, you know, I don't know. I've, I've heard of this before, that people, parents might get some pushback because, uh, you know, schools, sometimes schools have forms that they're used to using, that they want mm -hmm. to use. Um, and again, I would say that that's fine. You know, as long as it's a, a reasonable form that, that, that sort of covers core ADHD symptoms and then academic, social, behavioral, emotional functioning, it, I don't think it matters. Uh, you know, I wouldn't waste a lot of energy fighting over that. I'd, 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 I'd put my energy on, on, on making sure that some kind of a regular feedback on how the child is doing is, is part of what is expected that the school will, will do. Okay. Not as yeah. Right. Um, recommendation. Uh, question here is what, whether the, the recommendation is weekly or daily, and I'm just adding that the recommendation is monthly. Right. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the, the daily, you know, the more frequent, uh, the more frequent feedback serves a different function, right? So, you know, so m for the purpose of, of, of looking at, you know, how are things going? Are they going in a way that makes me think we, sh we, we probably do need to look into uh, adjusting treatment or not. Monthly is fine, but you know, daily is really valuable. You know, you're talking about like things like daily report cards or homeschool right, notes right. in terms of, 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 of really trying to, uh, you know, to link on a daily basis what's happening at school in terms of the child being able to meet a, a couple of key uh, goals with sort of consequences at home in terms of privileges that he or she mm -hmm. might get access to like TV time or computer time or something like that, you know, monthly, monthly isn't going to work for that at all. Right. That's, okay. that's way too long. But, 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 and so the, the, the daily feedback serves a very different purpose than this kind of systematic monthly monitoring that we've been focusing on. Got it. So this, this monthly monitoring is great for just a general treatment program is it working or not does it need to be tweaked whereas if your child's having serious behavior problems or other behavior or other issues that need to be managed in the short term you may need more more frequent feedback yeah you know that, that kind of those kind of daily report card things are really you know kind of an integral integral part of, of sort of a behavioral treatment program in and of itself um, so that again so that what the child is doing at school is, is linked to consequences uh, at, at home that, that same, that same day. Mm -hmm. And okay. you know, that, that, that's a t whole different kind of topic. Yes, exactly. Uh, very different. Yeah. Than, than a general treatment plan. Um, yeah, that's a good, really good point. Um, when a child has multiple conditions like attention deficit disorder and, um, autism spectrum disorders, is there a way to assess a different way that that would be better used to assess, um, how they're doing? Well, uh, I don't know so much about autism. I, I mean, I think that, um, 
uh, the answer to that is, is probably yes. Um, uh, in that, you know, n- nothing on on the form that you know that that we've talked about deals specifically with sort of you know uh, sort of primary symptoms of, of of autism, other than in some crude way the the, the, the one question on social functioning. Um, right. So um, so yeah, I, I would want to uh, certainly defer to somebody with sort of greater knowledge about. Uh, you know, kind of okay. autism that that I have yeah. about what what Maybe would make the most sense. Yeah. Right, right. Um, well, I think that we're going to end it here. This is really this is so terrific, Dr. Ruben. I hope you'll write about this for Attitude. I think it's really important, and I'm sort of shocked even that we haven't talked about it more frequently because it's it's so, so intuitively logical, and you provide such terrific tools that it's something that all of our readers should know about for sure. So thank you so much for the time today and for sure. providing these resources. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks again, Dr. Ravinner. It's really been terrifically informative. We're very grateful. Okay. Thank you for Bye. having me. Bye-bye. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. You love podcasts, the stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.